Washington Mornings on the Mall. At AM 630. It's 737 on WMAL, where Washington comes to talk. Larry O'Connor here alongside Brian Wilson. Coming up at 8.05, we'll be speaking with Trevor Maddich, our Redskins analyst, to talk about yesterday's heartbreaking loss at FedEx. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. We are joined on the line now by a former Speaker of the House, former presidential candidate. He's an author. He's a public speaker. He's a man about town. Newt Gingrich is on the line. Mr. Speaker, how are you? Well, I'm doing well, although uh, last night was a heartbreak. Oh, uh, wasn't it really? I mean, do you, well, let, well, let's get this out of the way. Everyone's talking it, about it. We might as well. We're going to ask you your opinion. Would you have pulled RG3 at the half? No, I think early in the third quarter when he was hurt again down towards the goal line, you remember, mm-hmm. uh, there's a point where he, where he goes out of uh, bounds, pulls his helmet off. I thought, you know, <clears throat> maybe at least take him out for a little while, let him rest and... Uh, see how his knee does, but it, it uh, the difference between the first half and the second half is as striking as any game I can remember. Yeah. Well, we're all sort of mourning that one. But uh, we... Look, he, he gave us uh, yeah. a great year. And, and, and more to come. remember that, uh, you know, for a rookie, it was just an extraordinary achievement, and he really helped energize the team and help, uh, I think, uh, motivated and uh, gives everybody a reason to look forward to next year. Well, we will talk to uh, Trevor Maddich about all this in just a few moments. Uh, Mr. Speaker, look, there's a lot going on in Washington right now, but we just witnessed some ugliness <laughs> last week as we tried to figure out how we were going to avoid going over the cliff. A lot of people think that Republicans got sort of rolled in that process, and a lot of people think that Republicans have a problem because they're not doing a good job in, in messaging. Do you have any recommendations for the Republican Party especially those in the House of Representatives? Well, I'm, I'm actually working on a strategy memo right now because I, I thought uh, some of the comments this weekend were very dangerous. Um, let me just give you three quick examples. I think the place to focus is the continuing resolution and the sequester. I think deciding to pick a fight over the debt ceiling is a dead loser. Uh, in the end, the Republicans will have to cave the, uh, the the objective reality of what would happen if we failed to meet the U.S. debt is so horrendous. Uh, every time somebody tries this, in the end, you can get something for it, but that's not that that can't be a central fight because then the whole issue gets down to: Are you really prepared to break the good faith and credit of the United States? And the news media sticks on that, and the president sticks on that, and it makes us look, you know, like we're either irresponsible or extreme. On the other hand. In the very same time period, you've got a sequester and you've got the continuing resolution. Those are fair game if the Republicans have the courage to actually stand by their guns because those are directly about government spending. Uh, And you can do a lot of different creative things on that. Second, when Republicans say they want Barack Obama to lead, I wonder who they're talking about. I don't want President Obama to lead. President Obama is a very liberal president who believes in bigger government, higher taxes, more bureaucracy, power in Washington, and secular social values. Why would I want him to lead? Uh, When I was speaker, we never asked Bill Clinton to lead. We asked him to compromise. We asked him to work with us. We asked him to uh, accept some kind of mutual agreement. Uh, This idea that Republicans say, oh, boy, the president should lead, he's going to lead us to higher taxes and bigger government. Speaker Gingrich, uh, coming on, looking back at what happened uh, last week on Tuesday, there's a split within the Republican Party and the conservative movement about who who won this thing. I mean, if George Will says, up, did we lose him? Oh, we lost the speaker. Hmm. It, that was a drop the mic moment. He made his comment. He said, He's done. Boom! I'm out of here. Exactly. He'll he'll we'll get him back. He on said, the line. Newt out. <laughs> all right. You know, you, you gave the big introduction of uh, Speaker Gingrich with all of his titles as, you know, yeah. former speaker, former presidential candidate, man about town. You forgot um, husband to Callista. That's right. Let's not forget that. And and uh, he took Callista to see a movie that you're very fond of. I know. They they went to see Les Mis. And, you know, one of the first things I ever wrote at the Breitbart sites, the beginning of my media career, Brian, was uh, about the stage play Les Miserables. My, my beat right. over there at Breitbart at Big Hollywood was to write about theater and uh, specifically about how politics intersects with the pop culture via the stage. And Les Miserables is actually one of the more conservative shows you'll ever see, despite the fact that everybody's singing. I know you imagine musicals as being 
seeing just, you know, boys in tights dancing around. Yeah. And there are plenty of those. But, <laughs> but in this one in particular, uh, I, I wrote about how it's probably one of the more conservative shows that you'll ever see, Les Miserables, and it's rooted in a deep, deep Christian faith. The fact that the, you know, the, the government is not the solution to anyone's problems and all that misery there in 18th century, 19th century France. And neither is the solution coming from the young revolutionaries. But in fact, the solution comes from an individual like Jean Valjean, who uh, goes out there and, and yeah, actually yeah, does yeah. something with his well, wealth. Spe- speaker's well, back on. I know, and that's why I'm setting it up here, because the speaker actually wrote about this uh, recently on his site. Talk to me about Les Miserables, Speaker Gingrich, and what sure. we in Obama's America can learn from this. Well, I apologize. We apparently crossed the cell. But um, <clears throat> first of all, I think uh, when you look at Les Miserables, it's important to remember people really were living in poverty of extraordinary levels. And the, in the Western industrial world, that ceased to be true, not because of government, but because of the power of private enterprise, the Industrial Revolution. People like Benjamin Franklin, who invented bifocal glasses, the Franklin stove, the electric, uh, uh, the, the, the lightning rod for electricity. Uh, people like uh, Fulton, who invented the steamboat, Henry Ford, who invented mass production. And if you, so first of all, just look at the scenes of the movie, which is a wonderful movie. Um, look at the scenes of the movie and realize the great driving force was people actually like Jean Valjean becomes wealthy as a manufacturer and who is, right, who is raising to a higher standard of living everybody working in his factory. Yes. <clears throat> Second, uh, the movie is a story about virtue defeating evil, uh, that, that uh, Jean Valjean himself is saved because a priest goes overboard to protect him from the law. He then rises, and because he has been saved uh, and he has found God, he, in return, acts decently to such a degree, of course, that, that Joubert, the, uh, the policeman, ends up committing suicide because his entire way of life has been discredited in his own mind. He's lost the moral argument about good and evil. Right. And, and what, but what do you say to the people who embrace the college student revolutionaries that, you know, the, that they were the real heroes because they were looking for change by, you know, uh, fighting against the government in the well, way that they the, did? The, first of all, it's a wonderfully romantic idea, and it failed. It failed in the French Revolution, <laughs> exactly. which, which led to Napoleon after an immense amount of domestic bloodshed. Uh, it, it, it failed in 1832, in fact, in the bourgeois uprising. Uh, the, the students, I mean, remember that... Uh, Victor Hugo is writing about a real event. Uh, but also notice the, the wonderful literary license that the one young, attractive, handsome revolutionary who survives happens to be the grandson of a very rich man. <laughs> and so, and so uh, the young lady can end up marrying at a wonderful home at a great wedding, uh, and everything comes together at the very end in a perfectly romantic way. Uh, the other point I may, I'd remind people as a conservative is the really bad guy in this movie is the state. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Mr. Thank Mr. you Speaker. so much. That's, that's You took the words right out of my mouth. Well done. <laughs> well, there we go. Movie critic and former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. This is why we love him. And, of course, he's the author of Victory at Yorktown. And, and the, he can talk about anything and bring it right back to where we are. I love that. And that's why Breitbart uh, loved Gingrich as well. You can't forget the culture. Thank you, Newt Gingrich.